So maybe I'll, I'll record this. So I first wanted to start with any questions you might have had on the exercise that was due today. Exercise five. What did exercise five ask you to do? Anyone say? What was involved in that? Ask you to create a simple what sort of model? Network model. And what what are the three types of modeling? Um, discrete. Um, there's just a model, an agent model. Okay, which type was this? Uh, it was agent. Agent based, yes. It's an agent based model. And it's agent based, right? We have a population of agents, right? We have a, we have a, uh, each agent characterizes that agent at an individual level, that person in this case. And we have a, an environment that places those agents in the midst of a network, right? And uh, agents have neighbors in this network. They are connected with others in this network. Networks are going to play a notable role in our discussion of agent dynamics in coming weeks. And this was your first uh, glimpse of building up a model of that sort. I want to talk today a little bit, especially because there were questions last time about it. I want to talk today about models of control and models of time that apply with agent-based model. And to that end, I asked you to watch a video for this class, um, which talked about different models of time in agent-based model. What were two models of time talked about in that video? Anyone? Uh, yes, Tony. Uh, discrete time and uh, uh, continuous time. Good, discrete time. What is discrete time? Great, great. Danica said it as well. Um, what is discrete time? Um, basically, time that um, being quantized into a whole yes. interval of time. That's yeah. So we have integer time. So time zero, time one, time two. Often these are called time ticks or time steps. That those are two of the going terms here. Um, they are integer. They're not real numbers. They're not three point one four one five nine two six. You know they they are they are um, integers and. The model goes through these successive times, right? Hops from time zero to time one, time one to time two, time two to time three. It doesn't progress in a smooth way. What happens at each of those times? What, what occurs at each of those times, those integer times? Events. Okay, event, events occur, yeah. And, and what happens at those times? Does nothing happen? If if nothing happened, it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a dynamical model, right? Because it's not evolving over time. So how does it evolve? It has changes. And who changes at those times? Well, most agents will change. And let me ask you a trick question. Suppose there are many agents and we are going from time zero to time one. And all those agents have to update, or many of them have to update. What order does that occur in? Those agent updates, Tony. Uh, this can be like random or uh, in parallels. Yeah, so, in, so early on in agent-based modeling, when the world was young, um, and and I was too. <laughs> um, not to say I'm the same age as the world. Um, yeah, I'm only four point three billion years old. Um, not four point five. No. Um, so when the world was young and it was still cooling and so on, and um, uh, the um, age-based models had adhered to this discrete time, but there was kind of looseness about how agents would update at a given time. So you'd have a big loop. I mean, for those who are computer scientists, you'll appreciate this, right? You have a, a big for loop, right? Um, 
So you, you have something like, you know, for time equals zero, right? Or, or I'll say for int time equals zero. You couldn't do this at that time because the C standard didn't allow you to put into, you know, uh, variable declarations in here. Time equals zero, you know, um, time is less than a hundred. If you go want to go for a hundred time steps and then you do time, what? Plus, plus, you know the, you know the shtick. Yeah, you know the pattern, right? Um, so there's a big time loop. Um, that sounds scary. I'm not talking about a physics time loop or something, right? There's a big loop to iterate over different times, right? And for each time, you would, you know, update agents, right? You would update the agents, and. And what would you do to update the agents? Well, you would guess what? Yeah. So, well, yeah, they're they would update based on their parameters, but you would go through each agent, right? So you'd go through each agent one by one. You'd say for agent equals zero, agent, you know, less than count of agents or something like that and uh, count agents and guess what i put here agents plus plus that's right agents plus plus and you loop the reach agent and you update that agent right here so update agent back in those days we didn't have the slash slash so we have a slash slash uh star yeah that's actually not a joke true um I sometimes joke to my students, you know, when I was young, all we had is ones and zeros. And, you know, when uh, when when Eric Neusfeld was young, all he had was zeros to work with. But no, the truth is he had ones too. Um, but uh, honestly, um, uh, you know, there, there was an update to the C standard that added this. But okay, so update agents here. What's the problem with this? Yes. And and name again? Rashid. Um, well, time complexity. Yeah, so you're gonna have time complexity one. What's the what's the running time of this? How is it gonna vary with the count of agents? And I'll I'll replace this by you know um duration or something. Um uh, what, how is the time complexity going to depend on duration and count of agents? Duration, yeah, duration, time, count of agents, right? Because you're going to loop on the outer loop by duration, and then for each of those iterations, you're going to go on the inner loop by count of agents, right? So time complexity is something, but that's hard to be, and, and that's still an issue. Um, that, we haven't gotten away from that. No, there's not a magic way to deal with it although we can parallelize and so on by dividing agents putting different agents on different computers but having to communicate when they're interacted with agents on other computers but I, I like that comment that's a substantive comment what's the other problem with this scientifically wade uh Danica that says can bias results due to synchronous time changes yeah you bias the results because scientifically this privileges certain agents which agents are i say it privileges them what do i mean by that anyone rashid so basically no agent zero will be completely correct and uh... yeah agent zero sir if like you know uh the first agent to update is in a way maybe they get the goodies right maybe they find the good places they can jump to before the agents find the places to consider jumping to places. So agent zero gets the privilege. It gets it gets the goodies before the other agents get them, right? It collects the blocks of sugar or it it goes to the to the neighborhoods that it wants to live in, and the others are left with the leftovers or something like that. That's kind of the idea here. And so at some point, this occurred in the maybe late 80s, early 90s, people started to really wake up to this. Oh, wait a minute. This is a problem because it's artificial, right? It's, 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 here we are, we say we're modeling phenomena in the world, but how we're modeling it 
is twisting the results in some ways we don't necessarily have to recognize, right? It's like we're having glasses that distort the world, how we view it, and therefore we're blind to certain phenomena in the world. So, Matthias. So, my question is, is there any uh, okay, so I'll, I'll comment on that in a minute, okay? Um, this was an older style of computation where you actually didn't have messages by and large. You had them directly reaching out and grabbing the characteristics of other agents and incorporating that. So I'd say like, look to my left, look to my right. I'm doing it the opposite. Um, but, you know, um, observe what's going on there, and I update my state accordingly. So there's no message. Messaging is actually asynchronous. So the messaging decouples when I send the message and when you get it, which is very helpful for dealing with this issue, it turns out. But there was this issue of, of sort of artificiality of this, that we could get very different results per Rashid's comment people realized, wait a minute, if you counted down the other way, instead of agent zero going first, if you went the other direction, you went down from the last agent, the results would be different. Maybe you'd see it visually different. It would it appear different. Yes. Uh, is, that really, uh, is that really binary search tree? There's no binary search tree here. This is... Uh, I mean, because you mentioned left, left or right. Yeah. Um, no. In this case... It's like a um, it has it's like a Turing machine. Bingo, actually, yes, that's true. Look on the tape to my left, look on the tape to my right. And, um, and you know, I make my decision. I'm the head of the Turing machine. Um, and I make my decision according. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting point. Um, but the point is that this twisted the results. It led to artifactual results. We would see we would see results come out visually. That's neat from the agent-based model, but it turns out a lot of it was just an artifact, an accident of how we happened to implement the model. And if we implemented this differently with a different ordering of agents, it would be different. So there are a couple of ways of dealing with this. One, as Tony said, is you could go in a what order? In a, a random order. So you have a different, you permute this, you have a different order with which you see agents. Each agent only gets to, to update once, but you have a, a permutation of the number, the, a random permutation. So maybe first you do agent 378, and then you do agent you know two, and then you do agent 103, and then you do agent 465, and, and you go through once each agent, and, and the next time you go in a different order. That's one way to deal with it. Another way to deal with it was you, you say, wait a minute, let's have a model that updates conceptually all agents at once. And, and we get away from this issue of, because agent zero updates first, then agent one, depends on those updates. You just say all agents update together in an atomic way. Now, the, for those not from computer science background, that's gonna sound scary, right? The agents are gonna update in an atomic way. But um, what do I mean by atomic here? What do I mean by atomicity? Anyone? Threading. Sorry? Threading. Okay, threading relates it, uh, threading is a is a technique for achieving concurrency, and when you have concurrency, there are there are issues of atomicity that are very relevant. But what do I mean by atomic? That something updates atomically, and and yes, um, uh, Mr. Dashati. Sorry, um, I think you mean like uh, independently or discreetly. Okay, so it means all of it updates together and conceptually it updates at once. You don't see it during it. You don't see the individual pieces updated. It's either not updated when you glance at it or it's entirely updated. So it updates in full, in total. And as a complete thing, it updates together. And the idea behind that was um, 
they all update in lockstep. None of them depend in their update on what the others are doing. Okay. So, um, and uh, Rashid had his hand up too. Yes. Uh, yeah, but they're, they are updating, updating asynchronously will come when we talk about um, the continuous model of time in just a moment. But here we're updating all agents together, um, but none of them, um, we're updating none before, con conceptually, it's as if we are updating them all at once, not one at a time. Let me let me show you this in any look, okay? So we're gonna open a model that was in that video that used discrete time. Does anyone remember what that model was? Uh, game, of life. game of life. Now it's not the only such model that is discrete time. And we'll probably take a look at another one, but let's go open that game of life if we could. So let's go to help, example models, and oh my goodness. Um, Okay, uh, Wade has his hand up. Uh, yes. Share your screen, please. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes. Boom. And there we go. Okay. So we're going to scroll down to not just Game of Life, but the Game of Life. Okay. The Game of Life. Yeah. Now, the Game of Life is one of the oldest. Um, agent-based models that caught popular imagination. And it came to prominence in the 1970s as a fascinating example of how complexity could emerge from, from simplicity um, in the world. And so in the game of life, uh, how many people here have previously heard of the game of life? Okay, it also goes by the name Conway's Game of Life uh, because it's named after the British mathematician Conway who, who developed it. And the Game of Life um, is an age-based model and a, and a member of a class of age-based models called, anyone know what this is? It's an example of something called a cellular automaton. <clears throat> the creator of cellular automaton person who first defined them was none other than, I mentioned his name before, he's the inventor of the dominant architecture that are used in every computer you're sitting with here. It's not Turing. Alan Turing was a towering figure that actually was contemporary with, with this uh, other towering figure. Alan Turing was in UK and this figure was in the States, yes. Sorry? No, von Neumann, yeah. Yeah, von Neumann. Yes, Tim. Uh, Stephen Wolfram. <laughs> so Stephen Wolfram, in the beginning of the 1990s, took up cellular automata with a passion and created a book where he argued that science will be revolutionized by the computational power um, uh, that that was afforded us now, and where these these types of models that we're talking about in this class, these dynamical systems models that deal with complex systems, that this would um, would engender the ability to reason about them, to manipulate them computationally, and with with computers would lead to a revolution in science. And he worked with cellular automata particularly with one dimensional cellular automata and demonstrated the incredible variety of um, behavior that could be elicited from very simple rules. And his book was called um, A New Kind of Science. And it's about, oh gosh, 1200, I, I don't know. It's, it's a massive volume. It's like yay thick. Um, and uh, he, he was, perhaps the most prominent figure who put his figure on this and said, um, you know, this is going to revolutionize science, computational science. And he, he uh, was prescient in the sense of anticipating by 
you know, by a good 15 years, uh, 10, 10 to 15 years, this sort of wholesale rise of of the science of complexity and and, and computational uh, science as it ramified across the sciences. Stephen Wolfram is, is a notable mathematician. He's also the creator of one very famous uh, program. Does anyone know what it is? Yes. Uh, Wolfram Alpha is the product of this, but before Wolfram Alpha, and I think um, feeding into a lot of its efforts is something called begins with A and oh, sorry, it begins with M, ends with A. It has a long title, Mathematica. Anyone hear of Mathematica? I hear it about yeah. it. Yeah. It, I think it was kind of in 2000s. I, I don't know. Maybe it turned to MATLAB, I think. No, no, no. I was using Mathematica as a, in 1993. Um, so uh, uh, MATLAB, MATLAB is, well, I, I'm not going to get into it. MATLAB is a, uh, is a, another product which existed back in the 90s and all through today, which is particularly used for engineering computations, but numerical linear algebra, um, uh, a lot of um, sort of, uh, a lot of numerical mathematics. Mathematica is a much more general program that deals with deeper mathematics and has some overlap with MATLAB, but it's different. It's 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 more it, it deals a lot with symbolic mathematics amongst other things. So you can integrate, you know, a, a symbolically written uh, function, for example. Okay, so so, so Conway in the nineteen seventies um, uh, created defined this cellular component, building on ideas of von Neumann. Von Neumann and Ulam in the nineteen forties and fifties advanced the study of a cellular automaton. And they were looking into actually how it could be used amongst other things to simulate life or, sim or lead to artificial intelligence. Um, tragically, um, uh, John von Neumann passed away um, uh, early in life. He was very involved in the US atomic bomb program. Um, and uh, he, he elicited a huge amount of funding, um, uh, but you know, many many people felt that he compromised his integrity by devoting so much of his mathematical gifts to developing the hydrogen bomb. And he went and traveled to various hydrogen bomb tests, including those in the Pacific, to observe, you know, those tests. And he developed brain cancer and he passed away. Um, it's a uh, it's a, a sad story. But John von Neumann contributed in his shorter life to uh, economics, to physics, to mathematics, and to computer science in a really key way. And he defined the cellular automaton. And John John Conway, um, the British mathematician in the 70s, took an example, defined an example of cellular automaton, which involved a very, very simple rule. Anyone, so people had raised their hands to indicate some people had encountered this before. Can anyone tell me what the rule in the game of life is? So cells are either living or dead, and under what condition will a cell that's living die out? And uh, yes? I think it's if it has three other cells around it. It will continue to live. Oh, what? Um, if it has two or three cells, it will continue to live. If it has fewer than two, if it is zero or one, it will die and if it is more than three it will die if it's too crowded or if it's too lonely right it doesn't have enough surrounding cells but two or three will continue to live if it's alive now so this is showing a cell that's alive now this red one um and if we step it one time step here um if we go over here when we say for example step one time step um and uh okay so why is this I see. So it's it's actually simulating it. And there we go. Um, so uh, here, these ones that were vertical, I'll switch to horizontal. Why was that? So what do you think the next step will be for this one? So if it's live, and if it has two or three neighbors, it will stay alive. Otherwise, it will die. If it is, if it is empty here, if it's not colonized, 
if it has exactly three neighbors, it will be colonized. Otherwise, um, it won't, uh, it'll just stay empty. So what do you think will happen with this one, the next time step, this this uh, horizontal one? Yes. Yeah, the planks will die. The planks will die. The middle one will stay. This middle one will stay. Good. Will anyone else around this be formed? Yeah, well, let me ask. Will something out here be formed? No. Why not? There's no neighbors. It's only those with three neighbors now that something will be born the next time step. Now, mind you, I'm talking about how the next time step is computed based on the current one, right? Um, and uh, so any anything around this going to be a form? Are neighbors considered diagonal? Neighbors are considered diagonal, yes. Oh, then yes. Okay, so which ones will form? Uh, the one below the middle and one above the middle. That is correct. That is correct. And um, if we go simulate this here, and I'm going to do it, we're going to go one time step. It's defined on one. So I'm just going to ready. And there we go. Mr. Deshadi is correct. Um, and you'll notice these others are updated. And we can go, you know, run this out. And you will see these ones, accordingly, are the Deshadi blinkers, right? They'll go back and forth, back and forth. Some of these other structures have more complex patterns to them. And if you if you go, if I were to speed this up, you'd start to see some patterns. Like, uh, I don't know if you could see it, but this one traversed this space here. I'll, I'll, I'll go start that again, just so you could see it. Um, here we go. And watch this, watch this uh, space here. I'm gonna slow it down a little bit. So this is evolving here, right? Um, and you'll notice this is evolving according to these very simple rules, but there's complexity, right? There's fairly complex patterns. In now, one of them, this one here is called a glider and it glides over the space, moves from one place to the next, and it's gonna collide with this. Each of these major building blocks, like this one actually has a pre deshadia name. This is called a block. This is called a stoplight. Um, and I can't remember what this is called. <laughs> it has some names. But uh, these things have various names. Now, um, the striking thing about this is we have an extraordinarily simple rule that can give rise to seeming complexity. Um, and if you run this on and on, you will see some, you know, interesting patterns uh, emerge from it. This is emergent behavior in a spatial context. Um, now, this intrigued a lot of people. Um, and, you know, people thought this reminded them of luck itself, hence the name Game of Luck, right? Um, uh, life has some simple prerequisites, but they can lead to complex behavior, complex and adaptive behavior. And the Game of Life um, was so intriguing that I'm told that for much of the 70s, this game was actually worldwide the, the you know the single largest um, consumer of computer power worldwide in the 1970s was running this game of life. People were looking for interesting patterns. They were looking for emergent higher level structures that would come out of it. They were seeding it with different starting points. They're working to to try to simulate it more quickly, uh, et cetera. Um, but a set of computer scientists, um, including a bunch of work at MIT, um, asked the question, could this game actually be used for computation? In other words, could you create a computer in this game that would be Turing universal? Can anyone say, what is Turing universal? Anyone? Um, yes. Maybe it can simulate an R and um, not. Yes, it can simulate not gates and gates and or gates. And in fact, it could simulate a Turing machine. It could simulate anything you could do on your smartphone in terms of computations could be done 
uh, with a universal computer. And basically, it turns out you can build up AND gates, OR gates, NOT gates, and you could create processors in this game. You can actually build up a computer in this game that will simulate and simulate, you know, the uh, the types of computers that are in the spring slab or what have you. This is computational universal. There's enough, even though the rules are extremely simple, there's enough requisite building blocks to build up these higher level structures and that can lead to all the way to running programs and running sophisticated programs, right? You could um, run run a program that would you know, calculate the weather across Canada on this game of life. It wouldn't be very efficient to do that, but it's possible. Now, this cellular automaton worked, had a model of time that was exactly as we were discussing. It's discrete time, as Tony said. Maybe someone back there can get the door. Um, because uh, not not everyone uh, throughout the building wants wants to hear about uh, these these ideas. Okay, so um, this is industry talk. Let's go look at the rules by which this evolves. Notice we have discrete time steps being counted up. So let's go here, and we're going to go down to the cell, to each cell, and we'll notice that there's a set of rules for this cell. And we're gonna click on it and you'll see there's a set of rules here that define the evolution of this system over time. Let me ask this. Is this a dynamical system? What we've just seen is the game of life a dynamical system? Does what happens in the next time step depend on the current state? Yes, yes. You bet it does. You bet it does. In fact, it depends only on the current state. It's totally deterministic. That's unusual for an agent-based model. Most agent-based models Similar things like behavior, individual people, and so on. There's a lot of randomness in that. A certain amount of randomness here. It's it's entirely deterministic. Its current state, whether one forms on that, you know, a cell forms above and below, and and these certain cells depends what's around it at this current point. Okay, so here are the rules. There's a rule for on before step and on step. And you may wonder what's going on here. Well, the idea is what I told you, that to be scientifically um, grounded, to be re fully reproducible, to, be, to not have artifacts of our implementation generating these kind of um, things that are more a reflection of our implementation than they are of the process being simulated. Um, what we what we do is here have this model where all agents conceptually update at the same time. So how is this carried about? After all, you have to update each agent, and it would seem invariable that if you update agent zero first, that's going to lead to agent one. Agent one's update depending on how agent zero was just updated. So how do we get around this? Yes, uh, uh, Rashid. Yes, question. So if we give this individual agent the property and when you're running the program initially, yes. that's when they give it on every individual, say, let's say we said get plasma button. Okay. So in that case, all the agents are running at the same time and engaging them. Okay. So all the comes down to the property that is set for each individual agent. For them to act as okay, so you set the initial properties for each agent and then they evolve, yes. Right. So they act in accordance with the properties of that that is combined them by I mean, the well they yeah, so they have properties, certain parameters that affect their evolution, but there's a key component here that agent-based modeling evolve that involves, and that is the agents depend on what? Other agents. Typically. So my evolution as an agent will be depend on, you know, the situation with my neighbors, right? Think, you know, whether I get sick will depend on whether Tony or Matthias is sick, right? Um, 
right now. If I pull down my map, you know, uh, then then I'm I'm going to be particularly affected by their health status, right? And so it's it's that interaction between agents that makes this problematic. Just updating agent zero first, and then agent one. If agent one depends on its nearby agents, then its update will have been affected by the existing update of agent zero. It's depending now not just on the state as it was, but the state as it has been updated for agent one, agent zero, which is township because conceptually we want time to go in steps, right? We have step zero. And when we're computing the change to step one, we want that change to depend on the situation at times zero, right? But if the agents are being updated one by one, the, the change that's taking place for one agent will not only be affected by what was the case at time zero, but what has been updated already in terms of some other agents. You see what I mean? So there's this artificial updating, you know, we, we want how it changes to be depend on the state as it has been, not on, you know, uh, we don't want it to sort of be updating agents in some order where my update depends on your update. We want it to be my, my update depends on what the situation was before anyone's update. So here, the way in which this is carried out is, it's a very clever idea. There's two primary ways I covered in the video, but one of them is shown here. So what goes on here is that each agent, before updating, before any agent updates, all the agents gather the information they need ahead of time to figure out what, what their update will be. They don't compute their update yet, they just gather all the information needed. And in this case, what do the various agents or patches need in order to update? What, what information do they have to gather? Yeah, the, the count of neighbors that are live, right? That's what the rule depended on, right? Um, if, if I'm an empty patch, like this patch here, if it's empty, if there's exactly three neighbors that are occupied, it will become occupied, right? If this patch is full, you know, whether it stays alive will depend on the state of the neighbors, right? Um, so all it needs to do to figure out how it will update, regardless of whether it's live or dead, it has to figure out how many neighbors does it have occupied. So in this on before step, what it does is it goes through each agent, each cell goes through all its neighbors and figures out, is that neighbor alive? And it counts the number of neighbors that are alive, right? And then, and so it's gathered all the information it needs to do its job. It doesn't have to look when, when the other agents start updating, and it is called the update, it doesn't have to look at what the state of its neighbors are again. It has that information in hand, the count of neighbors that are alive around it. So when it's asked to update, all it does is look at that information and figure out uh, if, if it is going to be alive now or dead. And that's what's computed here. So in short, it is updating in two phases. One gathers all the information it needs to update so that um, it is independent of all the other uh, neighbors when it has to update. It won't need to look at the state of those neighbors. And then we go and we update these and it doesn't matter the order because they all have the information they need to figure out whether or not they will be live or dead. So if we update one before the other, it doesn't matter. They, that order is, it's independent of the order. They don't have to look at their neighbors. They don't have to worry, oh, that neighbor updated. So I don't know if it was previously alive or dead. 
It doesn't have to figure that out. It has all the information it needs to figure out whether to update. Does that make sense to people? Yes, Rashid. I well, neural networks are another system where these patterns of emergence really come out, okay? So um, the connectionist methods, neural networks, deep learning networks, um, perceptrons before them, were all these architectures that were designed to capture aspects of something similar to sort of how neurons work in the world, but one of their defining features, particularly uh, neural network, artificial neural networks and, uh, and uh, deep learning networks that build on them is that they exhibit emergent behavior. The sum is greater than the, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, okay? And one of the reasons for this is they're nonlinear. Um, it turns out like the earliest generation, the late 60s, ended up really being limited because uh, it, it had real limitations in its formulations. But nonlinear network formulations have led to you know, the capacity to have huge, uh, express a huge number of different rules with neural networks. And those networks, like agents, are coupled to other networks. And like uh, like agents, they they evolve over. We might not call it time, but we might call it epochs, successive steps. Okay, and it has some relationship. It's a complex system, like those talked about here, and. Um, there is some need to kind of update the weights of these networks over time based on, you know, the um, discrepancy seen in something called back propagation between the discrepancy between what the network produces and what's observed from the world. And, and that does lead to a need to update the, the neurons. But typically, um, it's... It's not quite like an agent-based model where my, as an agent, my behavior depends on my direct neighbors to update. It's more like you look at the outcome of the network, you compare it with what you want, you discover where the discrepancy is, and you figure out what is, how, does, how to best update the weights in the network to get closer to where you want to go. It's like you're observing the emergent behavior of the network, and you're adjusting the weights in the network to get closer to that emergent behavior. Okay, so some similarity. So here we have two steps. This step, the first step gathers all the information that are needed to do our updates so that we don't have to gather that while we're updating because that would be affected by which ones are going first and which one before me or, or updating after me. And then we go and update based on that information. That's the two phase idea, okay? And what this leads to conceptually is all agents looking as if they update all together. It doesn't matter what order they come in. That's one way we handle that. The other way we handle it is we actually don't update the agents themselves as they are now. We update them in a alternative. Um, this is called double buffering. We update them we, we figure out based on their current state, what their state will be in the next time step. Instead of updating their state, we update what it will be in the next time step, compute that for all agents, and then switch to that as our time step. This is the game of life. Well, um, and the game of life um, is a model that exhibits this, this um, uh, time step uh, behavior. This is discrete. Time. Um, there's another model called the Shelling segregation model, which you can look at, which is is another spatially situated model. Okay, so this is discrete time. Any questions about that? Okay, so let's now go to continuous time. What is continuous time modeling? 
What's what's the difference with discrete time and continuous time? Yeah, John. Uh, I would say you just say uh, update in order, like uh, on the agent update in order. So so you can say there's an order, but agents. Uh huh. Did I hear something? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's event based. Yes, exactly. It's event based. And rather than time only updating time zero, update everyone. <laughs> time one, update everyone. Time two, update everyone. Not rather than doing that, you have time flowing in a continuous fashion. And we have events occurring at these moments in time these continuous moments in time these one event occurs at, at time 3.2563 another one you know 2.713 and and whenever these events occur uh, uh the events get handled um and sometimes that leads to one agent updating before the other sometimes uh the reverse and in other words if things happen in whatever order they happen to go, uh, happen in time. So most of the models we've been looking at have been of this sort. This is a model, for example, in continuous time. And Matthias uh, asked earlier about um, messages. So messages have a big role to play here as a role, as a means of communication between agents. So agents, instead of reaching out and grabbing the characteristic of another agent, often they'll communicate through messages. They'll send that agent a message, and that other agent will handle that message at some time. They will receive that message, and they will act on it if appropriate. So if an agent in the infectious state, for example, um, is spreading infection, if they have a contact, they will send a message to a random neighbor. And if that neighbor happens to be susceptible, it will receive this message. And we, so we have this asynchronous interaction between agents. You know, my uh, ability to update as an agent, like contact people, isn't doesn't depend on you getting and acting on the message right now. I sent it off to you, and now it's your business to handle that when and if you want to do so. So this is an asynchronous mode of communication. It's not that I'm blocked until you handle it. And I say, hey, handle it. No, no, no. It's, I just hand it off to you and say, OK, whenever whenever you do it, it's fine. It doesn't block me. That's an asynchronous situation. If my evolution is blocked until you handle it, that's synchronous. I My updates have to be synchronized with yours. I have to wait until you, you update. So here we have things going off in continuous time. The recovery occurs in continuous time. Becoming infected occurs in continuous time with this certain rate. So this might occur, you know, uh, at time after they come in, time 2.65, or it could occur at time 2.13, it could occur at 3.5. Um, but it draws from the distribution as to when it will occur, an exponential distribution, the same thing here. So this is a, this is a continuous model of time. Uh, things happen at sort of their natural times. With discrete time, one of the big difficulties that comes in, besides dealing with this ordering issue between agents, one of the big issues that comes into it is that you get this need to update with respect to different phenomena at the same time. So suppose you have agents that can die and spread infection. Here, in continuous time, that would be fairly easy to capture, right? Suppose we had uh, infectious agents that can spread infection. That's already captured here. What would I have to do if I want to represent the fact that they're at risk of death? risk of dying in this state. Anyone? Sorry? Okay, but um, how would we capture, suppose that while they're in an infectious state, 
they have a chance per day of 10% per day of dying. How would I represent that? Is the news stage for like that? Is that kind of like an active end of uh, Okay, good. So what I could do here, and I'll I will post this. This will be a modification of this model. Um, I'll say with death, right? Um uh and I can go add in here. What would I add in, Matthias? I add in something to represent death, the final state. And then what do I represent here? A transition, which goes from here to here, right? And what sort of transition would it be? If I have a 10% chance per day of going, it will be a rate transition, right? 0.1, yeah, 0 0.1 per day, right? And this would be called uh, death, right? Um, or 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 um, yeah, uh, death from infection. I'll say from infection, and I will show the name and we'll put it here, right? Um, so that's what we could do. And now we have, you know, when when someone comes in, these two are competing with each other in a continuous time model. Whichever occurs first wins, right? Uh, well, actually, it's more it's more complex than that because what's competing is the dying recovery, and then they're contacting people in the state, right? While in the state, they're contacting people. So, um, if they're fortunate, they will recover before they die. If they die, then, and we could put here, we could do uh main dot and there's a thing in main which is the name of the population you can go check it out it's called people so i would say here uh main dot remove people okay and i'm going to remove myself from this population here these two will be in competition this one could lead me to die first. This one could lead me to recover first. Whichever occurs first, you know, will be the one that operates. These occur at a natural time. Notice that this contact transition will be going on while I'm in the state. It doesn't involve me leaving the state. Okay, so that's how it's handled continuous time. Whichever one occurs first wins. Uh, how would this be handled in discrete time, do you think? Anyone? How do we handle it in discrete time? Um, state changes with, um, okay, if we have to update all the agents at once, at, at time zero, at time one, at time two, we have to update them all at once. We're gonna have to somehow figure out at time one, Okay, which agents got infected, which agents died, and we want to take into account when we think about which agents got infected, some may have died before they got infected, which gives the, sorry, before they spread infection. Um, others may have spread infection before they died, and you've got to figure that all out at the time of the update. Of all agents, you got to somehow figure out across all agents, you know, which which ones were spread infection first versus died first, and and you know which recovered before dying, and you got to figure that all out across all agents for that entire block of time, right? Which is a lot going on in that block of time, and a model like this is it's simple. But what does this have under it? I talked about it in that video. What does this have under it that allows these events to be handled? What What's underneath all of this that keeps track of these events? Anyone? I I, I, I had it in the video. Okay, there's a framework. That's, that's true. That's true, but... <clears throat> The framework has within it a what? A, it's actually over in here. 
sorry, what, what's, what's within the framework? It's a event begins with an S. Yes, the hand is up. Yes, event schedule. Your name? Noah. Noah is right. It's an event schedule. So there's behind the scenes, there's this schedule. And this schedule keeps track of all these different events. So when an agent comes in here, when they come into the state, there's some event scheduled. What events would be scheduled when they come in here? Anyone? Done, if I just say naively, not, not trying to be extra smart, and I come into the state, what events would have to be scheduled? So, so, sorry, uh, <laughs> Matthias, yeah? The recovery, the contact, and that. That's right. That's right. I I need to handle handle the fact that there's going to be a time in which they recover. I'll schedule that time, right? Time in which they they might die, and then a time when they might undertake a contact, right? From that. And these things are drawn from these distributions. So when we say that there's a rate transition, I told you I had a I had a graph on this very board. You know, if we were really careful, we might be able to find it in the top, top remnants here. But there was a graph that I had associated with this, the time till they leave, based on this rate, 0.1 per day. There's some distribution for how long they remain in the state. Who remembers what that was? It wasn't sinusoidal because it doesn't go negative. The, the, and so this is a probability distribution over time in state or time until event happens. I'll put it that way. Time until event happens. So if we have an event which occurs with with time alpha per day here alpha per day i'm gonna i'm gonna just put it here at whoa alpha 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 per day if i had that what would this time until the event happen what would that distribution look like there's some chance it'll occur really soon there's some chance it'll take a bit later some chance it'll take a bit later it's a distribution, right? I, I'm going to ask you, what does it look like? Does it look like that? Or does it look like that? Or does it look like this? Or or what does this distribution look like? If I drew that out, it's a probability distribution. Is it a to the power minus alpha z? Yes! 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 You got it! Good! Good, good, Tony. That is awesome. Um, That is fantastic. It is e to the minus alpha times t. That's what the distribution looks like. The probability of remaining in this until uh, un until a, a certain time. Or this is, yeah, the probability um, of remaining there until this event happens. If we look at the probability per unit time that they'll leave, you know, over the next day that they'll leave, it's totally flat, right? It's value alpha here. Um, uh, if, if we ask, what's the chance they'll leave in the next day? No matter how long they've remained there, the, no matter how long they've remained there, the time of leaving the next day is the same. Do you understand that? But if we ask, you know, um, uh, what's the time until the event happens, um, uh, it will be uh, a, uh, a a distribution that is decreasing over time. It's quite possible it will occur in the next day, but if it doesn't occur there, it's quite possible it will occur in the next day or the next day. Each day is successively less chance that it will have occurred there because it could have occurred earlier, right? Um, this is the chance they will survive until this time, right? You get that? Time they will survive until this time. 
So it's actually drawing in any logic. When you come into that state, it's drawing from this distribution. And, and it is actually, I'm applying slightly, it's one over alpha times this is a constant up front. But, but um, it's drawing for each of these. It's drawing from just from that to figure out how long it will be until that fires. And then what does it do once it's figured that out? It puts it in the schedule right here. Now, let me ask this. This is a type of question I often ask on quizzes. Type of question I often ask on the demand. Um, does it only add things here or does it take things away? From it? Does it need to take things away from the schedule? Is it only adding to it over time? Why does it take things away? Under what condition would it take things away? For example, uh, if the schedule is whatever task it's scheduled, it has been done, then it needs to take it. Okay, so, so one thing is time goes over and it, it takes away because this event is now in the past, right? And so it doesn't need that. So that that's true. But Matthias, you had your hand? Yes. It can also take away when the state changes. So yeah. if I go to recover, I don't need to have like a bathroom. Exactly. So this one, the, the, the one to recovery eliminates the possibility of taking that one to death. That's no longer, that's moot. That's no longer relevant, right? So absolutely, Rashid, did you have your hand up for something? Yeah. So if, if it is a problem, you can continue recovery and and, and there's a 50 percent chance of either of those things happening over time. So if they were equal rates, it would be a 50-50 chance which one will occur, right? If if this one recovery was three times larger than this one, the probability you'd actually go, if the probability of recovery per day was 0 0.3, the probability of, of death per day while infectious was 0.1. It turns out only one quarter of the time, one or 0.1 over 0.1 plus 0.3, you would actually go to death. Okay, so it will be equally likely if the two had the same rate, right? Um, the two are kind of competing for you in the same way, and it's it's a coin flip. On, on the other hand, this is much more likely per day you'll recover. Chances are you'll more likely you go that way, right? Okay, hey, but was there is there another reason? If I look at this model, if I look at this model, is there another type of situation here um, that could lead to events being descheduled? There's actually two of them here. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna just uh, I will elaborate this because we only have like um, one or two minutes left, I'm just going to put put something here. I'm gonna make this a rate transition as well, just, just for the sake of getting you to think concretely. Whoa, could you think, is there something that could happen here that would cause this rate transition to no longer be relevant? Matthias said it earlier, it's just a generalization. Yes, Harriet. Yeah, if they receive this message. And by the way, can a message be pre-scheduled? Yep. Not so much. For this agent, they don't know this message is going to come in. And suddenly, ba boom, they receive this, they receive this message out of nowhere, right? Sent by who knows where in the model. And so now they're leaving, but as Matthias said, they left this state, so this one has to be descheduled. And there's one final thing which could happen that could deschedule all the all the messages relevant for an agent. If the agent is going to disappear, right? If they die, any other, they may have several other state charts which currently have events scheduled, but they die. And there's only one schedule for the whole model. And so those events get, get taken out. So, ladies and gentlemen, this schedule is brokering all this, all the events across the entire model. 
And commonly, it will it will handle hundreds of thousands of events per second, for example. It could handle more than that. It could handle, in some cases, you know, a million events per second. But there's high demand for for the scheduler, and it's a key it's a uh, key sort of uh, bottleneck within agent-based models in continuous time, right? Um, so uh, here we have, um, okay, so uh, I'm just going to, oh, this one, eh, mumble. I see, I didn't connect it to anything. Um, but if you run this, just to illustrate this, and you folks can, uh, okay, so, so something's going, going wacky there, but I'll just run this one instead. So if you run this model, you will see over on the right-hand side, uh, there's an events per second being reported there. And if I go and speed this up, events per second, you know, thousands and thousands of events being handled, right? Um, uh, 620,000, 700,000, and so on. These these are the events per second being handled in the schedule. The schedule is just handling all these events for all these different agents. Could be thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of agents, each of which have all these events associated with however many schedules they have in place here, right? Um, and associated, as we'll learn, with, with many other types of things like uh, predefined event schedules for them, updating their graphs or whatever. Okay, that's all we have for today. Be sure to do exercise six and try not to be thrown off by the differences that Ardalan has noted between between things. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Ajul. And um, meeting uh, Thursday with with Harriet uh, nine thirty. Nine thirty. Yeah. yeah. I yeah, it's super messy, but it's working. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I kind of simulated the population, the starting population. Yeah. It goes to the jobs. Okay. I selected the job based on the level of vegetation. I don't know if it's a good idea or not. Right. Okay. Uh huh. I, I so these are the types of jobs. Yeah. Sort like, of yeah. low income jobs, uh, medium so and high income. Have yep. Higher education. Yep. I, yep. I've got some data from yep. Saskatchewan. Uh huh. And then they produce to the the production here is equal to the amount they put out plus a little bit because I'm considering kind of like sort of an exploitation from the firms because what I did before, mm -hmm. so it like, if the firms just got exactly your income of like, if they pay you exactly what you produce, right. they get zero, zero. Right? Yeah. So I put a 20% what Marx called mass value event. Okay. Huh. So 1.2. Right. And then it goes to the product market. Yeah. And then it, the, the, there is consumption that is equal to the income because we don't have more money than we are paid. So right. We buy. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 And it's kind of interesting, like how. Yeah. yeah. But if I just put the, the consumption being equal my income, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the 20% extra that from yeah. is exploiting you right. gets stuck in the product market. <laughs> so the, it, there is just some pile of stuff getting stuck. Here. So I instead of the government buying that actually, yeah. and it's buying that and transferring that to the firms. <laughs> okay, that's it. <interesting. laughs> no, it's, it's, it's like it's a little mocky, but it's kind of what you need to happen. Is that, that is really interesting. So, so with the firm exploitation by uh, of the the workers, yeah. Um, um, so they're extracting some extra, yeah, extra. Um, sort of uh what the workers could earn but the firm is taking it instead yeah in terms of their their you know what they would be worth mm -hmm. um is, is that money then being used by like the capitalists at the top of the firm to spend money yeah, to... because what happens is if yeah. there is no help for yeah. them yeah. it gets you know, all the extra value they exploit they exploit yeah the worker yeah gets stuck in the product market so it basically don't waste I think okay. because I can only consume the amount of money that I have as an income. I, as a person, okay, you can learn from banks, but 
in this yeah. magical world I've created. <laughs> you can only consume based on your, your income. So if the firms, there is no help, it just get like, they do not get the money, they just get the pro extra products. I, okay, okay. So, um, uh, yeah, that's, it's super early on the model. Yeah, it's, yeah, like, no, it's, I mean, what you're probing here though is very interesting and substantive. So that's the most important thing, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you're giving us some serious thought and I'd say, you know, uh, a good discussion will be to talk with uh, yeah. with her uh, at the next step. Yeah, big thought. Because you're building up structure that's capturing some features of the situation that seem non trivial. Yeah. And I will try to insert the uh, situation by uh, dropping production and then use some of the firms with higher people. Ah, okay. Um, it, that's the next step. Okay. So you're saying that the firms might be cutting back their hiring. Hiring, yeah. And that leads to people, for example, not flowing into those states of income earning. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds interesting, right? Thinking about how COVID affects those flows would be really worthwhile. So, so yeah, I mean, this, this looks, as I say, like you're starting to grapple with some pretty um, substantive issues and, and I'm, you know, just very pleased to, to see that. I think that's really I, good. I'm having a problem with uh -huh. say, implementing 